today we are going to talk about the scalar gravity. Uh, linearized the scalar gravity. Um, so finally we are going to talk about gravity. Um, So, so far we reviewed uh, special relativity uh, was discovered that the, the true symmetry of the nature is the Lorentz symmetry, not the Galilean symmetry. Uh, now we should also apply it to the theory of gravity. We applied it to quantum mechanics and find the representations of the uh, representations of the Poincaré group at par as particles with different uh, spins. Uh, now the goal is to construct a relativistic theory of gravity, something that generalizes the Newtonian gravity. So what is the Newtonian gravity? In Newtonian gravity, we have a poten Newtonian potential which satisfies uh, the Poisson equation. The rho is the mass density, and uh, well, it is extremely successful in describing uh, non-relativistic gravitational physics, like the solar system. Uh, but of course, it is non-relativistic, and um, so it doesn't fit in a, uh, in a relativistic framework. Um, Clearly, because this is an in, this gives us an instantaneous interaction, uh, so that we will get an instantaneous uh, one of the R squared force law between two uh, between two massive objects. Um, And nothing instantaneous can exist in a, in, a, in a relativistic theory because the concept of simultaneity is not well defined. So if two, two crosses are at the same time in one frame, in the other frame they won't be. Uh, in some other inertial frame they, they will not be simultaneous. So. Uh, if all inertial observers have to have the same laws of physics, they cannot have Newtonian gravity. Uh, so this is very similar to the situation of electrostatics, which gives us instantaneous interactions within charges. There we have basically the same equation that relates the density to the uh, electrostatic potential. Uh, and we know that the relativistic description of electrostatic is that we have a force carrier, a photon, which is a spin one particle. And this equation has to be generalized into uh, the in, in, in the case of EMM, it will be generalized into the to a Lorentz invariant equation for a vector field. that relates the, the, uh, the vector potential A mu to the charges. And then we will have interaction within charges which are carried out by the, by the photons and this is, uh, this interaction satisfies uh, the, uh, the laws of relativity. Now, uh, here is the same story. If you have some interaction between far away objects, the only way that it can happen has to be through the exchange of some degrees of freedom. Uh, so we should uh, look at the list of our degrees of freedom that we found by looking at representations of one car group and pick the right choice that describes gravity and has the correct uh, non-relativistic limit. Uh, so, and another point is that 
whenever we have long range force, the, the force carrier has to be massless. If we consider, ma uh, like in the case of electromagnetism, we have a long range electromagnetic force, and that is uh, uh, delivered by massless force. If we consider massive force carriers, then the range of the force will be finite. Mm -hmm. Uh, will be of the size of the Compton uh, Okay, so we should look at the massless representations. Um, so what is what are the choices? For instance, we can. Oh, another thing is that uh, we have large uh, background fields, large background electromagnetic fields, and large background gravitational fields. Uh, so these are classical fields that we feel, for instance, in our everyday life. Whenever we have some large background field, that means that uh, the, uh, the, the, the degree of freedom that describes that, that, uh, that field that cannot be a fermion, because it cannot have background fermion fields, uh, classical fermions. So we should look at the bosonic degrees of freedom. And the choices are integer, integer spins, 0, 1, 2, etc. Uh, uh, so 1 is not good because it gives repulsion between charge, between positive charge, while we know that positive masses attract. So 1 is ruled out. 0 is not ruled out, and it's even easier than 1. So the simplest thing to consider is, uh, is a scalar gravity. And we know that linear level that is described by a Klein Gordon equation. So this equation goes into a Klein Gordon equation with a source. Now, what should we put for the source? For the source, again, we cannot put some. Uh, we cannot put mass density because again mass density is not a is not a scalar Lorentz scalar, but uh, we should put something that in the non-relativistic limit reduces to the mass density, and some object like this that we encountered already is the stress energy tensor. If we look at the trace of the stress energy tensor, uh, this is a Lorentz scalar. And if we consider the uh, stress energy tensor for uh, non relativistic medium, in, in fact, the trace reduces to the density because let's consider, for instance, the, the stress energy tensor of a fluid that we were looking at uh, uh, last week. So, this, uh, the T mu nu. For a fluid, uh, it would look like this. There was uh, the energy density T, T0, 0, 0 uh, plus some kinetic plus potential energy. There was pressure. Uh, and then there were some other components here. Uh, so one thing that we saw was that, so, well, if I want to look at the trace, I only care about the diagonal elements here. And um, so one thing that we noticed or mentioned, rather, uh, nasty was that the, the contribution of the kinetic plus potential energy and the pressure to the stress energy tensor is suppressed compared to the rest mass con contribution for non relativistic part, uh, fluids. So, ray uh, is of order of the pressure, and both of them are of order of mn times v squared. So, if I look at the trace of uh, Taste of a stress energy tensor. I guess I'm I'm screwing up some signs here. Uh, so what, how should it look like? I guess it should be there should be a minus sign here.
and then the minus sign. So if I look at uh, if if I look at the trace, then it is going to be m n uh, times one plus order v squared correct. So in the non-relativistic limit, indeed it gives us the mass density. Uh, so this was for a fluid, but in general for non-relativistic medium, there is this feature. Property. Okay, so this is the the one possible generalization of Newton, Newtonian gravity in which we assume the force carrier is a scale. Uh, now we know that given some matter theory, we, we can calculate its stress energy tensor, we can take its trace and calculate what gravitational field it produces. Now I should ask how does the gravitational field back reacts on the matter field? Because that's what we are interested in. We have sun, it produces gravitational field, then air moves in that gravitational field, and is a force by sun. So uh, definitely we should also know, given a gravitational field phi, how the matter fields move in that field. Uh, now, in field theory, once I write this equation, I, I have already answered that question. So this is unambiguous because I have to write an action that gives rise to this equation. So there will be an action which contains phi field and maybe matter field. So what, what was the starting point? The starting point was that I had some matter field. Let's just call them psi collectively. So it could be some, uh, I don't know, some scalar field. Say so I have a massive scalar field. Um, potential with some interactions. Uh, once I have this matter action, I can calculate T mu nu. And using, and I can copy it to the phi field. So if I want to extend this action to give me this equation of motion for the phi field, there has to be another piece, the gravitational part of the action. that looks like this, right? Uh, it has to give me the Clan gordon equation when I vary the respect to phi. So up to some normalization constant that we are going to determine later. There will be a kinetic, then it's a massless field because it, ha it was supposed to give us a long range <laughs> force. Uh, and then there has to be a coupling to matter. Uh, and the coupling is to the trace of a stress energy tensor. Uh, with some coefficient, possibly. Yes? Why does it have to be massless? Oh, um, be because, uh, because gravity is a long range force. Uh, if we consider a massive degree of freedom, that will have a finite range. Basically, the potential, that's a good exercise uh, to show that if I add a mass term in here, it's not that hard. Uh, imagine I add a mass term to this equation. Or even here, I take this and add a mass term and take the non-relativistic limit. And then find the <coughs> potential for a point source. Uh, you set up the potential, uh, if I find it for a po point, so then phi will be, instead of being gm over r, will be gm over r times e to the minus mr. So it exponentially positive. Unless m is much less than all uh, distances that we have made measurements, uh, it will be inconsistent with, uh, with with what we have observed. Uh, yeah, so 
and of course I can set beta to 1 by just redefining kappa and the field. So the moment I write this equation, uh, and as you see, there, there is a relation between kappa and uh, this coefficient. Kappa is not arbitrary. Kappa is just 1 over 4 pi g. Uh, Hopefully the sign is correct. But anyway, this equation, there is a unique action that gives rise to that equation. Uh, so the moment I write this, this equation, this action is uniquely fixed. Once this action is fixed, I already know how the matter is respond or behave in the presence of the background gravitational field because I already know what is the interaction with the matter fields and T mu nu. Remember that this T mu nu is nothing weird, it's just a, a quadratic and possibly higher order mm. combination, local operator made out of this psi field. So it, for instance, it starts from D mu psi, D nu psi, um, minus one half delta mu nu minus d psi squared. Uh, minus, I guess, m squared psi squared. So it is some, so this, this term that I have written here Something that it starts from cubic order in fields, it has one phi and two, two epsis in T. And possibly it can have higher order terms. So essentially, this is a cubic interaction between size and the phi field. Uh, So the site is sources phi field, but also it reacts to it. So if I can consider an exchange of uh, scattering of this psi particles through the exchange of phi. And uh, that determines everything. How the matter sources phi and how uh, this source phi if, uh, uh, influences the motion, the dynamics of matter. Uh, so there is a there is a good exercise that I encourage you to do uh, in in the in the notes uh, to consider uh, to consider the scattering of some well we can consider different matter species of psi one field and psi two field. Consider just a scattering through the exchange of phi and compare it to ex a scattering in a background potential, background one over r potential, and see that they actually match each other in the in the correct regime, in the non-relativistic regime. So that would be one way of the particle physics way of checking that this is the this has the right Newtonian limb. Uh, what I'm going to do here is 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 a slightly different, uh, maybe 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 a bit simpler uh, technique. So one thing that we can do is that we can we find how matter sources fall. We can ask. If I have some point particle, how would it propagate or moves in this uh, background field? So we can ask, remember we had a point particle action. So there was some point particle that would move in a space time. Some x mu of sigma. And the action in the absence of external fields, it was just the lengths of the proper lengths of the world line or proper time. Hmm. 
we also saw that if the particle is charged and there is some background electromagnetic field, we can couple, couple the particle to this background field. So there was this, this uh, other term, the coupling of the board line to a mu. Um, okay, now let's, let's say charge is zero, so I don't like this. But now we have this five field. Uh, now we have this background five field, and we want to couple the board line to this five field. And uh, we want to assume that this five field is a small. Remember, we are doing linearized, uh, linearized gravity. So this G Newton is a very small number. And therefore, we want to linearize it. Uh, so we want to write some term in this action that couples uh, phi to the point particle. And uh, the only thing that we can write that linear order is to be satisfied the respect the symmetry is to basically multiply, include phi in this action with some lambda, which is at the moment a priori unknown, a constant, but unknown. So remember this phi is a function of f. And then we can ask, what is the what is the equation of motion that we get for this particle when we do variation with respect to x? The same way that we ask, what is the equation of motion that we get for a charged particle? There we uh, derive the Lorentz force, if you remember. Uh, now here we can ask, what kind of force law we we obtain? if we derive this action for with respect to x. So if we derive it with respect to x and take the non-relativistic limit and phi much less than one thing. Uh, okay, so maybe we can try to do it in five minutes.
will be much less than one. Five or no, five. Longer, I don't know. I don't know. For the moment. Okay. Uh, for five, it's going to be much less than one. And the last is much less than six. So this is variation with respect to what? When you say delta, so when we do variation, we have mm -hmm. the action as a function of some variables, like like here is x, for instance. Yes. So when, so what is what is delta phi? Delta phi. Mm -hmm. Phi is the function of x, right? So we get the delta phi because. Uh, x, the argument of phi has been like, so delta phi will be related to delta x. Uh, but in general, we want to write everything. So we want to factor out delta x, and what multiplies it would be the equation or motion. Right? So we should be able to this write delta phi also, also in terms of delta x. But this is not the you haven't taken the limit. Yeah, we can set, usually in the non adjacent limit, we separate the time from the space. Uh -huh. yeah, but there will be an equation. Yeah. So imagine if there was, imagine there was no phi, what would be the non adjacent limit of this equation? Right, it would be just the acceleration <laughs> equals zero. Mm -hmm. 
But now we want to see if uh, there is non-zero phi, but how would that equation change? What is the what is the force basically? What is the Newtonian force? Uh, that's the meaning of asking the take taking Newtonian theory or non-relativistic theory. In non-relativistic theory, we have Newton's second law, which relates acceleration to a force. Mm -hmm. So the question is really, what is the Newtonian force when we have phi? Okay. Mm -hmm. Follow the similar state as when we take mm -hmm. the limit yes. in the absence so of phi. So remember, in the absence of phi, we can yeah. ask the same question what is the non yeah. And what we get is the, it's just a new yeah. thing. Basically, the acceleration equals zero. Why? So in here, case. in the presence of phi, and instead of ac m times the acceleration, acceleration means yeah. zero, we get m times acceleration equals something. We yeah. want to see what yeah. that something yeah. is. Oh. Um, so it should be two times this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you have the same yeah, thing yeah, in the Yeah, yeah, you can. Then the each time there will be this one. This is similar to the, uh, so essentially the time derivative will be um, yeah, that part of taking the non thing is something changing very fast and it's not non Like imagine you have sun that produces some static, almost a static uh, heat, Newtonian potential.
So yeah, we want to do the variation of this action with respect to x, and then take the non-relativistic limit. Uh, so we send x to x mu to x mu plus delta x mu, and we want to ask what is the change of the action. Uh, so delta s is going to be equal to minus m. Uh, there is uh, the taxes that come from here. These are the usual terms that we had before, but even in the absence of fart. Uh, square root 2 is a square root. Um, the min minus twice eta mu nu x mu d sigma. Delta x mu d sigma. So I use the symmetry of eta mu nu to put this factor of 2 here. In principle, there are two terms, but they are the same. So this is the first term that we would get it also in the absence of phi. There is a the second term because phi is a function of a. So when I vary x, there will be this additional term, which is uh, square root of the thing times lambda delta phi. But phi is a function of x, so delta phi is just d mu of phi times delta x mu. So here I have a derivative acting on uh, delta x mu. So what we do is that we do integration by parts. We use the fact that delta x mu has to vanish at the boundaries. Uh, so that gives us uh, after that, I can factor out delta x mu. And then in this first term, uh, because I did an integration by powers, I cancel this minus sign, this 2 cancels with this 2. So I get d by d sigma of uh, uh, 1 plus lambda phi divided by the usual square root d of x mu d sigma. And then the second term will be again the usual square root lambda d mu of phi. So the equation of motion is basically mm -hmm. this setting this term equal to zero. If I want to rewrite it, it will be d by d sigma of 1 plus lambda phi divided by square root of minus eta mu nu dx mu d sigma dx mu d sigma and dx mu. Uh, well, let's call this some other indices, alpha, beta. Sigma um, uh, 
And now I take this phi term to the left hand, so minus lambda d mu, uh, minus lambda square root, mm -hmm. where it's a square root I, I can, so there is a square root that I can bring it to the left hand side, or I can divide everything by this. Uh, we we remember that minus eta alpha beta dx alpha d sigma dx beta d sigma is nothing but beta over yeah so it's the derivative of the proper time with respect to the parameter of the length so if I use that uh, this derivative with respect to sigma will Turn into derivative with respect to tau, so I get d by d tau of 1 plus lambda phi dx mu d tau is equal to minus lambda d mu of phi. Hopefully, the sign is correct. Is the sign correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, any questions so far? So uh, one check is that if I set phi to zero, I get the usual or the equation that we have. Uh, second derivative of x mu with respect to tau is equal to zero. Uh, now we want to take the non-relativistic limit, assuming that phi is a small. Uh, so in the non-relativistic limit, before if phi was zero, we would get uh, basically um, so this is Newtonian, non-relativistic. Uh, if, if phi was zero, what we would get was just a Newton's second law without any force. So it would be acceleration, uh, which is uh, which is just x i double dot equal to zero. Uh, that's when phi is equal to zero. Now, if you have uh, if you have some non-zero phi, this equation will be modified. Uh, so, if non-zero but a small, then we are we are expecting to get something uh, some Newtonian force in this equation. So, the question is that what is this Newtonian force as a function of phi. Uh, okay, so how do we do that? Uh, we we look at the um, so first we look at the zeros component of the equation that uh, that tells us how how t is dependent, t is related to tau. So, um, so we know that there, there is, uh, if, I, if I have dx mu d tau, that, that, is, that is the four velocity of my point particle, and this is gamma 1v. Uh, in the non-relativistic limit, then v is much less than one. So for this, uh, uh, for this, I then need to look at the uh, zeros component actually. So if I look at this, uh, uh, we know that in the limit that v is much less than one, dx zero, d tau is equal to one. Right, because the exterior theta is gamma, but gamma in the non relativistic limit is one. So derivatives with respect to tau turn into derivative with respect to x zero, which is time. Up to be a squared correction. Then 
Then we look at the i component of this equation. Uh, and so in the, the i component of the equation was 0 in the absence of 5, right? x double dot was 0 in the absence of 5. And now we have phi here, but it's multiplying the velocity. So if I'm looking at d by d tau of 1 plus lambda phi times, now there is this dx i d tau well, minus lambda d i phi. Now this term is going to be ordered of order of velocity and it's multiplying phi uh, so since phi is already a small this term is negligible because there is a linear term in phi in this equation this term is phi times a factor of velocity in fact there is another uh, time derivative that makes it even small so that that term can be negligible uh, we'll, uh, end up with the usual term on the on the right hand side. D this uh, d two by d tau squared of x i equals minus lambda d i phi, and then we use the fact that d d x zero by d tau is equal to one plus order b squared correction. So that uh, that equation becomes so if I call x zero T and use the fact that dt d tau is 1 plus order b squared corrections, I will get uh, d2 xi dt squared equals minus lambda di phi. Then we multiply both sides by m. So we see that the Newtonian force that we get is minus lambda m di phi. Now, if this phi is the Newtonian potential in a non-relativistic thing, which is supposed to be, uh, if we want to reproduce the usual, uh, usual Newtonian gravitational force, we should set lambda to 1. Because F Newtonian is just minus M times D I phi, where phi is the Newtonian potential. Oh, sorry. Okay, so now we have, um, so we have seen that this action with lambda equals 1 reproduces the Newtonian force. If we take phi to be Newtonian potential, we cannot consider uh, coupling this action to the, uh, like adding the, adding the kinetic term for the phi field to this action. And trying to derive, and try to derive this uh, this equation. So let's do that. Because so far we treated in here. So far, phi was treated as some background field that it exists uh, as given. But of course, everything uh, has to be. We have we have to provide the dynamics for everything. As, in principle. So we want to also provide the dynamic for the phi field. So we want to write some action that now works for the phi field as well. So we know that this action has to have this uh, uh, 
uh, this uh, differential operator or gives us that equation motion profile. Uh, so that is, as we wrote, the d4x times minus kappa over 2 d5 squared. Um, now we want to include this point particle action and it's coupling to the to the fiber. In order to do that, we we use uh, the Dirac delta function. So we add, uh, or rather, we, we add this uh, point particle action, but using using the Dirac delta function. So in principle, I'm doing d now considered as a function of phi. But this is equal to d4x uh, minus kappa over 2 uh, d5 square um, minus And I only keep the part which depends on phi, so only this term, because now I want to uh, find what is the, how, how does this point particle action, how does this source the phi fit? So only the part, the part that depends on phi is relevant for us, because now we want to do variation with respect to phi. Um, because of that, I have set this excess to be to assume the background value, and then I can use sigma to, to uh, the, the then this uh, this combination just becomes theta because I have fixed the trajectory. No. So now no variation with respect to x anymore. Uh, there is lambda phi here, so lambda is one. There is a phi. And now I have this d4x, so there, there, I put a Dirac delta function that sets x mu to be the trajectory of the particle. What is what, what, what are we trying to do? Uh, so what, what we are trying to do is that first we said if I consider some point particle, and there is some background phi phi. Uh, I can couple that phi background phi phi to this particle to get the right uh, the right Newtonian force. Mm -hmm. Now, once I couple this phi phi to this particle, once I understood how to couple the phi phi to the particle, I can ask how the existence of this particle sources the phi phi. In order to do that. I have to include the kinetic term for the phi phi. I have to write an action for the phi phi, the, the kinetic term and a source term that comes from this point particle. Mm -hmm. And now I vary that action with respect to phi. Mm -hmm. Then that, that tells me how, how this point particle sources the, the phi. Mm -hmm. So we want to see both the face. Both. Uh, basically what I was describing here, how the phi field in influences the motion of particles or other fields, matter fields, and how matter fields source the phi field. Mm -hmm. So this is an example to see how these two come together. These are not two separate things. Once you say how some, some field sources another field, then it, it will also be influenced by that. Like, like using the, I don't know, like a green function or something? A green function to, to like, put a force in terms of, uh, I mean, the solution of the equation of motion with a, a, free, a green function and, and a force, and, and a current or a source? 
Play that. When you have a source in a differential equation, uh -huh. you can solve uh, the differential equation by assuming that the solution is a green function, I integral the green function, mm -hmm. the source. And in that, more or less, more or less that is the idea of what you're doing, like integrating the, the field with the with the delta that is like the trajectory. Yeah. Uh, then no, this is not uh, I'm not this is not a Green's function. So I have fixed the trajectory of the particle. I'm asking how it sources the uh, how it is coupled to the phi field. The, the Green's function. We are going to talk about this later today, hopefully. It's like it basically it means like I have a particle, and this particle, uh, yeah, like it is coupled with the phi field. So at the I mean, the delta says that this is a, the delta says like, okay, this is the trajectory of the particle and uh, infinitesimal trajectory, but it, this trajectory also coupled with the phi field, so it is also providing a source for the phi field. Something, uh -huh. something similar to the electromagnetism, like, yeah, something similar when you couple the A mu with, with the D, Dx mu, something like that. Uh, yeah, that's what I just wrote here. Uh, uh, okay. We are doing, uh, we are coupling the point particle to a background field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, first, we asked how the background field affects the motion of the particle. Mm -hmm. Then I'm asking, fixing the trajectory of the particle, how would it source the, the field? Mm -hmm. uh, you could ask a similar question. Uh, for a, for a part for a charged particle, how a charged particle uh, sources electromagnetically, mm -hmm. you would get a current associated to a charged particle mm -hmm. uh, using the same idea. In fact, it was I think one of the exercises. Uh, so yeah, this is analogous to that. Uh, Green's functions is a method to solve differential no, equations. So for instance, the differential equation that we get for this phi field, we can use Green's functions to solve those differential equations for arbitrary sources. But let's wait a little bit to talk about Green's functions. OK, so is there any other question at this moment? Uh, so this delta function, uh, are you familiar with Dirac delta function? Yes. Yeah. Something like in, uh, delta of x is equal to zero if x is not equal yeah. to zero. Oh. An integral dx of delta of x over any interval that includes zero is one. Yes. Now this delta four is just four delta functions for the four different x's. What it does is that if I I can just integrate it with respect to this d four x and everything disappears. So this times that is really just one. Uh, However, uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use the one of these delta functions to get rid of the tau integral. But, or maybe before that, I can just do the variation with respect to phi phi. So if we do a delta s delta phi, that gives us the equation of motion for the phi phi, which is going to be kappa box uh, the inversion of phi. The inversion is defined as minus p t squared plus d uh, plus Laplace. Uh, so kappa the inversion of phi is 
equal to um, m time integral d tau delta 4 of x mu minus x mu of tau. So this is the trajectory of the particle. This x is the, the any space time point. So remember this phi lives in the space time. It's a field. Uh, now I can do, there is an integral and a delta function. I can use delta of, so let's write this as delta of x0 times delta 3 of xi minus Uh, big X I. Then I can use this delta function to do the first integral. So this is just m divided by d x zero by d tau absolute value uh, times delta three of x i minus x i of tau. This object is just the Lorentz factor gamma. So what we get is m over gamma times delta 3 of xi minus xi of tau. Now if you remember what is the T mu nu, the stress energy tensor for a point particle, uh, you will see that that is This, this object is exactly the trace of that T mu nu. So we can derive the stress energy tensor of a point particle using the same Norbert method. And uh, the result is minus P mu, P mu divided by P zero times delta three of x minus xi minus big xi of tau. So if I take the trace of that, it reproduces, reproduces that. So, so this is exactly t of point particle, trace of t of point particle. And in order to get the right uh, Poisson equation, for the Newtonian potential, this kappa has to be related to the Newton's constant. Kappa has to be 1 over 4 pi g. Okay, so, I'm, so far we have fully fixed the uh, we have fully fixed the, the action for the scalar gravity, the, uh, the quadratic action for the scalar gravity. Um, meaning that we have the quadratic term and we know how to couple it linearly to the sources. So the linearized equations is fully fixed. We checked it against the point particle agrees with the Newtonian expectation. Uh, so what do we do next? Uh, we just check it. Uh, so by construction, this is some theory that agrees with all of the Newtonian expectations because we built it uh, based on Newtonian equations. So they, uh, it passes all of the Newtonian tests. Now we can ask what are the new predictions of this relativistic theory of gravity? And uh, then those, those new predictions, relativistic predictions, can be tested, like uh, starting from about uh, 100 years ago. We had enough precision in our experiments and observations to test those relativistic predictions. So now, uh, the task would be to determine, uh, to understand the phenomenology of 
this uh, scalar gravity theory to see what are what are its prediction and whether they agree with the observations or not. Um, okay, so what are the what are the phenomena that are new to the relativistic theory? Uh, there is a list of them. Uh, there is gravitational redshift. There is bending of light, uh, or no bending of light, depending on what is the theory. Um, there is the uh, the uh, the prehelion of Mercury, the precession of the prehelion of Mercury, and then the uh, probably more in, most interesting feature is the gravitational waves. So all of these questions can be asked in the context of a scalar gravity, uh, and can many of them have been measured in in uh, great accuracy, so it can be compared with the observation. Uh, so we do some of them. For instance, we can do redshift. It's the easiest one. Uh, so imagine I have some some five field which changes, but it changes very slowly in in a space. So a static five field phi of x, like the gravitational field of the f. So, for instance, we have f mass m latest r, there is phi, which is gm over r on the surface, and at infinity, say it goes to phi goes to zero. There is a minus sign. Very important. Um, now, we have, now we can ask about the working of clocks in this background field. So that's the concept of redshift. Remember, we had this example of uh, observers moving with acceleration, and they already had redshift, right? There was one observer sitting in some inertial frame, and another one accelerating. And uh, if you remember, there was uh, so there was Alice here and Bob, and you we would send signals, and the clocks of the accelerated observer would measure different values. Uh, sorry, it would work uh, with a different rate. In fact, even, even when we have uh, relative velocities, we get different rates, the gravitational rates. Uh, so now, here in the presence of the background field, we want to ask, how would the clocks work? <laughs> how, do they, how do we how do measurements of time at different locations in this different at different locations with different values of phi be compared to each other? Say on the surface of the air, so I have some clock here. Uh, so I have some clock here, or maybe on the surface of the air, so I can I I want to compare it to a clock that is at infinity, say where the gravitational potential is zero. Uh, so we said that the clocks measure the, the good clocks measure the proper distance. Uh, also, of course, the working of clocks can be in, influenced differently in terms, depending on inter, their internal dynamics, can be influenced differently by some external. Uh, but in the case of this uh, gravitational field, and if we have clocks which are good clocks, meaning that they are very uh, small in size, and the small means that they are the sizes or internal frequencies are much much shorter and much faster than the rate of change of the background field, then uh, something universal happens. Because let's go back to this uh, look. Look again at this point particle action. If 
or in the in the presence of this background. The lambda we said is one, so there's five here. Now, if the uh, so imagine different elements of this uh, this little cloud are some point particles that are moving under some internal forces. Uh, if if phi is approximately constant over the time scales and distance, the characteristic distances of the clock, then essentially the only effect of this phi field on the working of the clock is that the coordinates of the clock can be redefined. So if I work with some other coordinates, x tilde mu, which are defined as 1 plus uh, phi, um, times x mu, then, then essentially nothing happens. So in terms of this tilde coordinates, the dynamics of the clock would be identical to the to the dynamics before in that pre, in the absence of the phi field. So if it has some internal frequency omega zero, then we expect that that omega zero should correspond to one over delta x tilde zero. Because x tilde is the coordinate that doesn't is as if this phi field didn't exist. Uh, however, phi is a function of x. So we can ask, we have this coordinate system, this phi, phi which is uh, non-zero here, and at infinity it is zero. So we can ask what is the, what is the frequency that is measured at infinity, or yes, say omega infinity, which corresponds to the point when phi is equal to zero. And that is related to one of the delta x zero. So then if we use this relation, you can relate the frequency of the clock when there is a potential and frequency at infinity, or any other point. Uh, so if I use that, uh, what do I get? I get uh, omega, say infinity divided by omega zero is equal to uh, so this this can be written as one over one plus phi times delta x zero. So omega infinity is equal to one plus phi. Times omega zero, or so imagine this uh, this clock is sending pulses, like in this example. Uh, so there is this clock on the earth and it sends pulses to infinity. Uh, so the pulses are sent every one over omega zero in this unit and we are asking the, the observer at infinity with what rate that observer uh, receives the signals and that will be the frequency that they receive. So the, and omega naught is something that is internally fixed. So if there is an identical clock in the in, at infinity, that clock would work with omega naught. Uh, so this phi potential, whenever we have positive masses, which is always the case, this phi is negative. So what it tells us is that once you go deep inside the gravitational uh, field, the clock is going to uh, work slower because the frequency of the clock as seen from infinity is slower than the internal frequency that was set. 
a universal thing because phi is negative. So the, the the one who is the the if you have a twin uh, if you have a twin uh, twin brothers the one who is who lives in the gravitational field is going to live longer because his clock is working as slow. Yeah. Yes, I'm saying that if if this phi field was a constant, mm -hmm. then you mm -hmm. could you could just redefine oh. x by x tilde, and nothing would change. Okay, okay. Just the energy, I mean, just the frequency. Hmm? It's a frequency. Frequency. Ah, uh, say it again. Just the energy. I mean, with the of a no, I'm saying that in this new coordinates is as if you are you are just living in the empty space without without phi. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all of the measurements that you, every uh, every uh, every observable once expressed in this new tilde coordinate has the same value as it, as in the case of phi equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Not just energy, and anything that you measure in this new tilde coordinate would be the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then these signals are sent to infinity to someone whose clocks are working with these x variables. So they are then they are compared and then they get different frequencies. Okay. But the crucial assumption is that the internal dynamics has to be much faster. Than the much faster and the characteristics are much smaller than the uh, changes of phi. Okay. And that's the reason we can consider phi to be constant, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, so the other thing is that whether not in a relativistic theory, we also talk about light or ultra relativistic particles. So we can take a massive particle and boost it infinitely. It becomes ultra relativistic. It's light. It's similar. It behaves the same, basically the same as light rays. Now you can ask if I have a, if I have sun or some massive object and a light ray passing by gets to Earth, whether, it, uh, whether the gravitational field of sun affects the motion of this light ray or not, which has got the light bending. Uh, so we can also answer this question here. Uh, now we should look at the, the equation that I erased. So we derive this uh, equation motion for a point particle, we derive the full relativistic equation of motion. Uh, let's remember how it looks like. It was d by d tau, 1 plus phi, times d by d tau of x mu equals minus uh, d mu of phi. Now let's imagine that phi is time independent. If phi is time independent, uh, so this is light bending. If phi is time independent, then the zeros component of this equation uh, gives us a constant of motion because d by d tau of something is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. So we get 1 plus phi times dx zero d tau equals some constant that I call 
minus E over M because it's related to the energy of the constant. But E is a constant, so I just call it. Um, okay, so then uh, let's also assume that phi is this small, so we can again neglect uh, higher powers of phi. Then uh, what we will have here will be uh, uh, d by d tau, d2 by d tau, d tau squared of xi. Now I'm looking at the other component of the equation equal minus the i of phi. Uh, now we can eliminate uh, or exchange replace d by d tau by uh, the with respect to derivative with respect to t x zero. So if I do that, I can. What do I get? I get d a zero d tau squared <coughs> and x zero uh, let's call x zero t So this term is what the t by d tau is just uh, this minus sign cancels because it raises zero index. It will be e squared over m squared times uh, x i d two x i d t squared equals minus d i phi. Or if I take it to the other side, I get d2 xi dt squared equals minus m squared over e squared di phi. So know that in this limit, then phi is much smaller than one. this e over m is nothing but the Lorentz factor. Right? This uh, dx0 by d tau is uh, just the uh, zeroth component of the four velocity. So this is just minus gamma, the Lorentz factor. Now, I'm talking about a massive particle. However, I'm boosting it so that its energy becomes much larger than its rest mass. Or the Lorentz factor is going to go into infinity. To, it's becoming much, much larger than. So what we see here is that as I make this particle more and more uh, ultra relativistic, as I boost it faster and faster, it's coupling to the to the phi field, the potential field becomes smaller and smaller. So. The limit would be the limit of massless particle is equivalent to taking infinite, infinite Lorentz factor. So in the limit, basically the the light we get a massless particle which decouples. Which decouples from this scalar gravity. So what it implies is that uh, light actually doesn't bend uh, by this gravitation force. So what happens is that it actually goes with straight. Uh, 
Uh, that's a that's a prediction that has been falsified now by uh, in with much precision. So if we didn't know anything and we invented this scalar gravity, like if we didn't measure anything else, that would be that that would be one of the things that would rule it out experimentally. Um, the gravitational redshift has been measured and has been confirmed. Uh, now we will see that this gravitational redshift is very universal. So also for uh, also in the case of a spin two gravity that we are going to consider later next week, we get the same gravitational redshift. Uh, however, the uh, the bending of light will be different. There. So we get a different answer. The other, the, the other uh, topic or prediction of this uh, relativistic theory of gravity that we need to discuss is gravitational waves, uh, which I guess we should discuss tomorrow. Um, yeah, I, I was going to give an out outline of the discussion, but uh, I guess we can just do it too much. Uh, is there any questions? So, mm -hmm. for example, if I want, I would like to, would like to compute the trajectory of like a non relativistic, like a If you if you give me the field, yes, then this is the uh, this discuss the motion. It can I mean it can be either relativistic or non-relativistic. You don't need to assume anything. Uh, here I was just showing that if it is ultra relativistic, it decouples. It just moves on the straight line. But if it is very non-relativistic, you will get the same answer as in the as in the Newtonian theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? See you tomorrow.